Beloved, what a joy it is to be with you again tonight uh, for the second installment of our continuing series on the battle uh, of the ages. And uh, we are looking at uh, that uh, whole subject of Protestantism. And we are saying that it is indeed under siege. And so what a joy that it is uh, to be together again. And uh, thank you to all who are joining us now uh, for this live broadcast. We are delighted that you could make the time and we are praying and hopeful that the time that you invest with us here tonight is going to be profitable to you. So without much ado, if I may lead us to the Lord in prayer, we would be right underway with our lecture tonight. So let us come to the Lord in prayer, please. Our precious and heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you were with us yesterday as we introduced this course together and we are coming back to you tonight, uh, praying for mercy and grace and strength and help, both in terms of clarity and in terms of understanding that there will be fellowship between me and my brothers and my sisters who've joined me tonight. Lord, I am pleading and I'm praying that there will be profit that will come to your people as a result of this series that we began yesterday and are taking up today. So do send your spirit and be with us, Lord, for we ask these things only in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, what we have to deal with tonight is the subject, why study Protestant history? Why is this important? Why do we need to be engaged with a subject like the one that we have before us? Now, part of the discussion that has to go into this, we anticipated yesterday, we began to sort of look forward to it when we mentioned that there is such a thick ignorance among churched people with regard to Protestant history. And even those that would identify themselves as Protestant really do not um, understand fully what it means to be a Protestant. And so we said then that that's one of those reasons. And we also said that we think in our estimation that outside of the record of Scripture, outside of the Bible, we scarcely can think of a greater, more impactful move of God in the history of the church and of civilization as we have come to know it. So this then becomes a very, very vital subject that ought to exercise our minds. It is my duty then in this second installment, in this second lecture, to explore with you about five reasons. And when I'm done with those five reasons, I'm going to be uh, stopping uh, our lecture together tonight. Five reasons why we must study Protestant history. Five reasons why we must study Protestant history. Those are the ones that I'm going to put across to you. And the hope then is that we are persuaded even further that this is a most vital subject that indeed we get our time and our attention and where possible even make investment in terms of the books that I recommended to you yesterday and uh, some of which will probably be scrolling at the bottom of your screen right about now. And so it is quite significant and important that we attach uh, the kind of importance that we ought to attach to this subject uh, that we turn our attention to now. So then the question is, why should we study Protestant history? And by extension, that question could be asked for the larger history of the church, which I hope to get engaged with in the next uh, a few days and weeks that lie ahead uh, of us. Why should we be engaged with this study? Now, I'm going to give us reason number one. Reason number one, reason number one, if you're taking notes, if you're writing, this is a good place to pick up your pen and your paper and take down. So reason number one, why we are engaged 
with this subject, with this conversation, is because church history, and particularly Protestant history in this case, is God's story, and as such, it is our story. I'm going to say that again. Church history in general, and we will engage ourselves with it, but in particular, Protestant history is God's story, and because it is God's story, it also is our story, and therefore we need to study it. When you study church history, ladies and gentlemen, what you're looking at is the unfolding of God's plans on earth in time. Those things that God decreed before time began. Those things which God ordained that they will come to pass before time was inaugurated. Those things are now applied in time and in space. And that is what we call history. As a matter of fact, let's put it this way. All history, even that which we call secular history, is ultimately God's story. All history is God's story. Somebody put it in a lovely way. He said, all history is his story. His story. God is at work on earth doing something. We see the unfolding of his plan. Now we read, for example, that which is written in Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4 and verse 34 and 35. Daniel chapter 4 verse 34 and 35 and here the words that are very very important and quite applicable to the situation that we are dealing with now and i'm reading from the english standard version daniel chapter 4 verse 34 and 35 at the end of the days i nebuchadnezzar daniel chapter 4 verse 34 and 35 at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me. All right, Nebuchadnezzar. What did you see then when your reason returned to you? And I blessed the Most High God, says this king, and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to Two generation, verse 35. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will. Did you get that? He does, the Lord God, does according to his will. All right. Among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? So what Daniel is telling us here in the words of Nebuchadnezzar is that God does whatsoever he pleases. Whatever is good for him, whatever he likes, God does in heaven and on earth. What I'm trying to tell you now is that all history is really God's story. All history is God's story. And so we do well to study that history. Now go back to Isaiah, because I think there is a few things there that are going also to help us to clinch this point, to establish this point. Isaiah chapter 46, Isaiah chapter 46, I'm reading verse 9 and verse 10. What lovely words there by the prophet Isaiah, chapter 46 of Isaiah, those of you are writing verse 9 and verse 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, says he. Verse 10, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times 
things not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. So what Isaiah is telling us here is that God has ordained all of history and he is acting within history. That was the language of Daniel chapter 4. He does what he pleases. Isaiah here tells us that which we see as the end, God already determined from the beginning and has already, has already arranged and ordained the details that will fill up history. Now, let me then say something here that I've often told my theological students. And here it is. That which we call history is an accumulation or a progression of time. I'm just going to say that again so that we are together in this. Okay, watch for it. That which we call history is nothing more than accumulation and progress of time. For example, as I speak to you now, minutes are counting, seconds are counting, hours are counting. And what I said five minutes ago is now history because it's time passed. History is nothing more than accumulation and progression of time. Now, who inaugurated time so that we have history? And that will have to take you back to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, we are told in the beginning there was no time, there was just, you know, eternity and nothingness. And Jehovah God breaks into uh, space and he begins creation. And we are told it was evening, it was morning, the first day. And therefore we are made aware of the concept of time. So the concept of time, therefore the concept of history, is a creature of God. I'm just going to say that again. The concept of time, which then leads to the concept of history, is a creature of God. The question then is, why did God create time before he begins to fill up creation? Because then when God created time, God uses time as a vehicle to carry his purposes. As a vehicle to carry his purposes. God is eternal, but he works within time. So God creates time as a vehicle within which he will accomplish his purposes. He will accomplish his purposes. So then what I'm trying to say here is that history, church history, particularly, is the doing of God, is God at work. It is God at work. Now, if that be true, and I hold that it is true, and I hope you understand that it is true from Daniel chapter 4, from Genesis chapter 1, from Isaiah 46. By the way, you can throw in as well Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 11, that God does all things after the counsel of his will. All right. If, 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 if those have been established to be true, then ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you, that there can be no greater undertaking for a Christian man or woman than the study of church history. There can be no greater undertaking for the Christian man or woman than the study of church history because all history, therefore, is God's story. Now, the good Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the good Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote a book, Authentic Christianity, Authentic Christianity. And in that book, in volume 1, page 147, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones makes this statement. He says, I know of nothing more instructive next to the Bible than church history. I know nothing more instructive next to the Bible than church history. Therefore, then, we are better off studying the history of the church. Now, let me read you something from this book that I recommended to you yesterday, just in clinching this first reason why we must be engaged with church history. This is God's story, the unfolding of God's plan, God's purpose is being worked out on the earth as we engage with history. We are engaging with God's activities. We are engaging with God's plan. We are engaging with God's doings on earth. Now, here is what our brother uh, says here on page 10, actually, of this book. Actually, it is Roman numeral 10. 
Roman numeral 10 of this book, The Greatest Century of the Reformation. And I read you these words. As priority, we need to know our Bibles well. This is what this man says here. As a priority, we need to know our Bibles well. All right. By the same token, he says, by the same token, as much as we want to know our Bibles well, we want to be acquainted with our Bibles, to be familiar with the text of the Bible, as much as we engage with the Bible, and we must. This man says, by the same token, we ought to be well acquainted with history. Because history is his story. The story of the Reformation is the story of God's mercy towards mankind. It is a story of God's power to overturn unrighteousness and to establish his truth in a fallen world on a large scale. There is so much that we can learn from this chapter in church history. So Peter Hammond and his, the people that wrote that forward agree that this is a most fulfilling enterprise to undertake. This is vital. This is vital. Second reason then. Second reason why we must study church history and in particular the Protestant history. Second reason is so that we might not only learn but also preserve genuine Christian heritage. Why should we study church history and in particular Protestant history so that we may not only learn but be able to preserve genuine Christian heritage? Now, here in Africa, particularly in Kenya, and in particular the communities in Western Kenya to which I preach and I belong, people lay a very heavy, high premium on learning one's heritage. They want to teach you where were you born, which family do you come from, what are your cultural norms, what are the traditions of your people, who are your neighbors? Who are your relatives? We are told these things as a heritage so that we may learn it, understand it, and hopefully then preserve it. Now, why do they do that? Because they want us to be a distinct people. People take a lot of pride in their heritage. I mean, we, have tri we are a tribal country here, and that tribe X will rejoice in their tribe. And tribe B will rejoice in their tribe. And they will want to preserve it. You hear people talking about lost heritage. We are losing touch with our culture. We are losing touch with our heritage. They want to preserve that heritage because it is essential to their identity. Now, not only is a heritage essential to our identity, a heritage also preserves us from making certain mistakes for example, like marrying the wrong people, mixing with the wrong people. Some people have found themselves in incestual uh, relationships, marriages that are untoward because they never understood their heritage. Perhaps they were born in a town setting without some cultural background. They met, boy meets girl in town, boy proposes to girl, girl says yes, they get together and get married without knowing their cultural backgrounds, whether in fact they are closely related. That is a failure of knowing your cultural background. We are saying that as we study church history, and particularly the history of Protestantism, we are not only able to be familiar with our heritage, but we are also better placed to preserve it. Now I'm going to make a statement here. A sweeping statement, if you may. Perhaps the single greatest tragedy. I use the word perhaps. The single greatest tragedy in Christendom, in Christianity, 
And shall I say particularly Protestant Christianity is the failure of our appreciation and understanding of the heritage that we have. Let me rephrase that. Let me put that in a different way so that we may be able to understand one another. I am saying that there is a lack of continuity in that which we call the faith of the saints. A generation from now will inherit a brand of Christianity that has undergone significant changes. And the generation after that one will receive an even more changed version of Christianity. So what I'm saying is it keeps changing and changing and changing so that by the time it comes to the fourth generation, it is no longer the faith of the saints that we used to talk about. Now, Throughout these lectures, I will be making a very guarded reference to something I'm calling Catholic faith. And right off the bat, I need to make a distinction that when I'm talking about Catholic faith, I'm not talking about Roman Catholic faith. The word Catholic simply means universal, universal, international, all-encompassing, that which embraces us all, be, be it that you're in the United States of America. If you embrace the faith of the saints, you are my brother. Be you in Australia, in New Zealand, in the United Kingdom, in Zimbabwe, in South Africa, in Botswana, in Malawi, in Uganda, in Tanzania, wherever you are. If you subscribe to biblical faith, that is what I'm calling Catholic faith, universal faith. And that is why we make an attempt to call that Roman Catholicism, but I'm talking about Catholic faith. So now, the faith of the saints is to be preserved for generations and generations because this is the heritage of the people of God. This is important. Lack of this heritage, lack of this Catholic faith. Now, you understand what I mean by Catholic? Universal, not Roman Catholicism. This Catholic faith, where it has been discontinued, where it has changed, where it has not been preserved, what has emerged these days, ladies and gentlemen, is what I'm calling an egalitarian brand of Christianity. Now the word egalitarian simply means an individualistic kind of faith. A faith that I have that doesn't look like the faith of the other brother. A faith that I possess that doesn't look like the faith of the other sister. It is not the Catholic faith to which we all subscribe. It is an individualistic faith because the heritage has been lost. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, we are lacking a standard, a template, a prototype by which to measure all else. I may be privileged to be in a neighboring country called Uganda. And I have been privileged, as a matter of fact, to be there a number of times, several times. And in DRC Congo, several times in South Africa and all these places. And it amazes me that every time that I am there, there will be one or two people with whom we speak the same language of faith, who believe like I do, who speak as I do. And immediately, even though I never met them before in my life, I shake their hands, I hug them because they are my brothers and sisters. You see what, I talk, what I'm talking about? Catholicity of our faith, the universality of our faith. Now, where that heritage has been mangled and destroyed, there you have what I have just labeled an egalitarian kind of faith, an individualistic kind of faith. And you hear people begin to say, oh, you, do, you don't understand it the way I understand it. You understand it the way you understand it. Let's all accept one another. And so the Christian faith becomes fluid and sort of elastic. Fluid and elastic. It means different things to different people. The heritage is lost. Where does that failure come from? 
failure to understand the history of the church and in this particular moment, the history of Protestantism. Now, one of the reasons I am writing that book, Children of Rome, to argue that in fact most of that which we call Protestantism is actually Roman Catholicism by another name is because people don't have that history. They don't know what was fought about. They don't know the price that was paid for the faith we now hold very casually and we now want to change at every whim and at every turn. We can't assess the cost because we don't know the history, you see. Now, an egalitarian faith is a faith without a common denominator. See, we are living in days of diversity, days of tolerance, days of ecumenical sort of amalgamation. We all ought together. We must be open-minded. We must be tolerant. And so on and so forth. Now, I'm going to read you again something from that book by Peter Hammond, The Greatest Century of the Reformation. In the foreword, a man called Mike Evans writes this thing here in page 5, Roman numeral 5 actually. This man writes in this regard. He says, there has never been a greater need for a book on the Reformation than now. Why? Historical facts have been at best ignored or blurred, at worst evacuated. The absolutes of yesterday, like sola scriptura, like sola fide, no longer hold sway. Instead, the uncertainties of open theology, the vagaries of experimental theology, and the insistence on unity have all but cancelled the non-negotiables of the Reformation. But how do you even deal in terms of protecting if you don't even know what the Reformation was all about? So we must be familiar with our heritage, but also be able to defend that heritage. Now I'm going to read you from the Bible, Psalm 48, verse 12. And 14. Now what I'm going to be arguing now in this point number two, that we need to not only be familiar with the Protestant heritage, but be able to defend it. And that is why we must study it. I'm going then to look at scripture and scripture will highlight for us the importance of engaging with the history of the church. It's not just academic, it's very practical. Psalm 48 verse 12 to 14. Again, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Psalm 48 verse 12 to verse 14. Consider well, say, sorry, verse 12. Walk about Zion, go around her, number her towers, consider well her ramparts, go through her citadels, that you may tell the next generation, that you may tell the next generation, all right, that this is God, our God, forever and ever, and he will guide us forever. Tell the next generation. Jude, Jude verse 3. Jude verse 3. Again, we find words there that encourage us to be familiar with the faith of the saints as a heritage and to defend it, to fight for it, to struggle for it. In the words of Jude here, to contend for it. Verse 3, Jude writes, It says, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. Now, you know that the Lord Christ in Luke chapter 18, verse 7 and 8, the Lord Christ in Luke chapter 18, verse 7 and verse 8, the Lord looking at his disciples, he says, he asked them a question, almost anticipating, expecting that there will be terrible times. The Lord says, nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith in the earth? The Lord was concerned with the continuity 
of that faith, with the presence of that faith. Second Timothy chapter 1. Second Timothy chapter 1. Second Timothy chapter 1. Now Paul here is speaking to Timothy. And the words that he speaks to the young man remind us of the importance of preserving the Christian heritage as it was handed down to us in history. Here it is in verse 5. I am reminded, says the apostle to this Timothy, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Louise and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. So you see the transfer of the faith of the saints. From your grandmother, Louise, it came to your mother, Eunice. I am persuaded, I myself, Paul, that that same faith is in you. Louise preserved it. Eunice preserved it. Now, uh, Timothy is expected as well to preserve it. And those words appear in chapter 2, the same chapter, the same book. The same book of 2 Timothy, now in chapter 2 and verse 2. Paul tells him, And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Again, I invite you, see the way that thing is being passed on as a baton. You, Timothy, I was there. I, Paul, and Paul obviously hears from Christ himself. He says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 23. The same things that I've heard from the Lord, these same things I hand down to you. So Paul had them from Christ. Christ himself says, I say nothing except my father instructs me from God to the Lord Christ, from the Lord Christ to Paul. And Paul now speaks to Timothy. Timothy is supposed to speak to faithful men who will teach other Faithful men, you see, the faith of the saints is a heritage that is to be passed down from generation to generation. We cannot countenance this individualistic faith, this egalitarian faith, this sectarian understanding of the Christian faith. But that happens because people have no template. People don't know history, you see. Now, reason number three then. Reason number three. And reason number three flows, flows, comes out of reason number two. Reason number three. Why must we study Protestant history and church history in general? So that we might stem the mushrooming and prosperity of error. So that we might stem, or rather stop, the mushrooming and prosperity of of error. Ladies and gentlemen, we are living in times of great apostasy. Times of great apostasy. Times when, in fact, we have a problem with almost everything. There is false doctrine everywhere. Evidently, the scripture uh, predicted a time when there will be an escalation of false teaching. Whether you're talking about 1 Timothy chapter 4, uh, sorry, chapter 6 and verse 3, talking about 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to verse 5, so 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 to verse 12, Matthew chapter 25, 4, verse 25. I mean, all these texts tell us, in fact, Acts chapter 20, verse 29, they tell us that we are to expect a day when error will increase, will mushroom, error and uh, deception, falsehood will prosper. But how does falsehood prosper? Falsehood prosper where people don't know the reality of the faith. They say you can only be duped to adopt false currency if you don't know the true currency. So why should we study church history? Because as we study church history, we say number two, we understand our heritage. We know the nature of our faith. What has been believed all this time? Sometimes we call this the test of orthodoxy. The test of orthodoxy. When I hear a new teaching, when I hear a teaching that unsettles me, 
I look at the Bible, obviously. I look at the Bible. Does it look, that does it find agreement? That is find support in pages of scripture. But I also have another test. I'm going to say the church has been here for 2,000 years. God's people have dealt with things for 2,000 years. From the Lord Jesus Christ to the apostles, to the early church fathers, to the patriarchal period, to the, you know, this uh, medieval period, right to the days of the Reformation. Up until now, God's people have been grappling with these situations. Has this teaching been there? So I'm looking at our heritage. I'm looking at our history and I'm saying this teaching, does it find support there? A very clever wit, a very clever mind once said, if you know something today, if you discover something today that has not been known and believed for 2,000 years in the history of the church, the chances are you are probably wrong. If you know something today, if you discover something today, some kind of a revelation which Jesus never had, apostles never had, 2,000 years of church history, it was never believed that, and you believe it now, chances are you're wrong. We sometimes call that the test of orthodoxy. How does this new teaching tally, gel, agree or disagree with the historic faith of the saints? So as we begin to study church history, our discernment, we are still in point number three, to stem the mushrooming and prosperity of error. Our discernment is that much enhanced. Our ability to distinguish error from that which is true is that much improved. The man called George Santayana, an American Spaniard, once said, those who cannot remember history are doomed to repeat it. Those who cannot remember history are doomed to repeat it. They will commit the same mistakes because they do not have a history. And if they do not have a history, therefore they do not have a template. They do not have a standard by which they might measure that teaching which in fact they are dealing with now. Those who do not remember their past are condemned to repeat their mistakes. So we learn church history. We learn Protestant history. Now, let me just give you an example in terms of sort of uh, anchoring these uh, abstract words in example. You know, there came a point in the history of the church. This is in the 19th century, the middle part of that century, round about the year 1829, there came on Christian scene something that took the Christian scene by a storm, completely took over, redid the way we do evangelism and the way we do outreach, the way we bring souls to the kingdom of God was completely changed. We now call it the invitation system, the sinner's prayer. The altar call system, that kind of system was not there until about 150, 170 years ago. Popularized by a man called Charles Grandison Finney. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if people had known their history, they would have said, no, 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 no. This that we are seeing here is not a new thing. It may have been improved, but isn't it the same thing? of Roman Catholic deception of going to the priest, walking from your home, because apparently God cannot hear you from your home. God cannot hear your prayer unless it is mediated by some special man at the front, going to the priest, confessing your sins. Isn't this the same thing they do when you come to the front and then you're led through a sinner's prayer? It is just another version of the confessional of Roman Catholics. Now, there are people, another example, and one time as we were having conference in our church, a man sneaked in and when we went for a break, he stood up in front of the people and he somehow talked about some anointing oil, went into his court lapels and fished out a bottle of oil and he began to anoint people and I came out to explain that whole matter. Now, why do people have this doctrine that we must carry some vials with anointing oil? 
and anoint people, you know, things like that. Well, if they had just understood their history, they would have known this is that doctrine of Roman Catholicism, which is called extreme unction. In Swahili, those of you are Swahili speaking people, Kupaka Wagonjwa is a Roman Catholic doctrine. But now it's been baptized by Protestant, by sort of um, evangelical, a Pentecostal, charismatic names to make it sound different. And of course, they will throw scriptures at it like James chapter 5 to make it look all right. It's a misinterpretation of James chapter 5, but that's not our subject today. What am I trying to labor here in point number three, why you must study church history and particularly Protestant history is so that we might identify the errors for what they are. Scripture says there's nothing new under the sun. That which is, was, and will be. I mean, the, uh, Martin Luther said, it's the same devil dressed in evening clothes. It's the same devil dressed in evening clothes. It's the same devil. So as we get to know history, understand our heritage, we begin to know the difference between that which is true and that which is not true. Now, I'm reminded of a text in Malachi. I can't quite bring it to mind. But there's this story in Malachi where, uh, is it in Malachi or Haggai? Something there. But when the temple had been rebuilt, the old Solomon's temple had been rebuilt, the younger generation who never understood history, who never knew the move of God back in the day, were rejoicing and they were happy. There were voices of rejoicing in the camp. They were celebrating at the restoration of the temple. But scripture talks about some few old men who knew what the glory of the former temple was like what it was like to have the sacrificial system and the Ark of the Covenant within it and the glory of God, the Ichabod, in it. They understood that which was. Scripture says they never participated in the celebration. They never participated in the so-called revival. But Scripture says they wept in their hearts and they regretted because they understood that that which was at the beginning is not that which we are seeing today. Now, there are some of us, ladies and gentlemen, who look at church scene today and look at the biblical record and study church history and look at the great evangelical awakenings of the 17th century and the 18th century. Look back to the Protestant Reformation and the darkness of Roman Catholicism that was rolled aside. And we cannot celebrate that which we see now because it, we know it is far short of that which ought to be. It is far short of of that which ought to be. So the third reason why we study church history, and in particular now the Protestant history, is so that we might stem the mushrooming of and prosperity of error, falsehood, and deception. And I want you to watch out for my book, Children of Rome, because I'm detailing why I think the church scene today is simply Roman Catholicism under another name, and as my friend Billy Skate said, Roman Catholicism on steroids. But there's a fourth reason, as we rush towards the end of this, a fourth reason why we must study church history, and particularly Protestant history now. In studying church history, we get to participate, isn't that wonderful? We get to participate in events before our time, and we get to fellowship with the saints that have gone by. In the study of church history, we truly become Catholic faith. I go back 1,000 years ago and fellowship with the saints back then. I can go back 1,700 years ago and fellowship with Athanasius. I can go back about 17, sorry, 500 years ago and fellowship with Martin Luther, Ulrich Zwingli, John Calvin, those mighty forbearers of our faith. I get to participate in history. I get to live in their days. I get to feel what they felt. The Catholicity of my faith begins to be improved. The texture, the flavor of my faith is that much more enriched. It is a sad and tragic thing that we see today in the egalitarian faith that we see today, in this individualistic faith that we see today, in this recent faith that is only 21st century, it lacks the richness of that historical background 
Oh, the church of Jesus Christ. The church of the firstborn in the language of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. It says, we have come to Zion, to, to the city of the living God, to the company of angels in festal gatherings. He says, to the spirits of just men, made perfect, to the church of the firstborn. We have this uh, consanguinity. We have this fellowship with Abraham, with Moses, with John Calvin, with Martin Luther, with George Whitfield. We see a Spurgeon. Oh, dear me. We have them in the same church and we rejoice together we get into their minds get into the experiences nothing boils our blood nothing brings us into fellowship with the history with the saints gone by with the events that went before other than church history and the things that happened there ladies and gentlemen we find ourselves in that celestial unification of the church of God. The redemptive plan of God is seen in a singularity. We, you know, we, when we go to church history, we begin to see that common thread that unifies the church of the living God. We begin to see the story of redemption and how God has dealt with his people, Jonathan Edwards, that 18th century, I believe, revivalist did talk about the history of revival being the history of the excellencies of God's extremities working out on earth. Oh, dear me, we get to be there. As we study church history together, it is a poor Christianity. It is a, a destitute Christianity. It is a destitute faith. It is a poor faith that which is removed from history and from that which God has done in the past. Oh, remember the things which you have done in the past. Oh Lord, we might even pray. And that kind of reflection that brings me to reason number five and the last one in our lecture tonight. Reason number five, why we must study church history and particularly Protestant history is so that, reason number five then, we may draw encouragement. Oh, this is what wonderful. This is lovely, that we may draw encouragement in times of decline and declension. So that we may draw encouragement from these times of decline and declension in religion. We are encouraged. We are encouraged. We are edified. We are told by church history, don't despair. Keep going. God has done this before. Can't you see? God will do it again. Especially in these days when our hearts are bleeding in terms of the corruption we see in the church. The mangling and the destruction of that which we know as authentic Christianity as we weep and cry and decry the fallenness, the apostasy within the church as we look at church history, as we read the great moves of God. We are encouraged that we are not the first generation that has gone through this. We are not the first people that have seen this kind of corruption. Then we look back and see God did that. He might do it again. God moved in those times. He might move again. We are encouraged in times of decline and declension. It's very depressing. As you hear people, and sometimes when I preach, people are discouraged. I tend to go back in history and I tend to analyze the situation. My students are used to this now. I tend to analyze the present church scene in very graphic and very depressing terms because it is fallen, it is corrupt. It, is, it doesn't look like the church which Christ would be proud of, would have uh, uh, approved. But even as I speak in those terms, I must be reminded, and I must remind those people to whom I'm speaking, that they might take encouragement from looking at history, that in the history of the church, God has moved, God has worked, God has done things in the past, and because God has done things in the past, he might just do it, again. Now, very quickly then, church history encourages us to pray. It tells us God is still working. God is still working. And those things that he did in the past, he will do them 
again. He will do them again. Now let me read you again, just for good measure. In uh, the greatest century of the Reformation, again, Roman numeral 10 is the page I'm in. The writer here says, If conditions in Europe were so abysmal before the Reformation, if conditions in Europe were so abysmal, bad, before the Reformation, and if that part of history is a demonstration of how mightily God is able to step in and change the course of history, then we ought to take fresh courage from the fact that our God, who does not change, is able to do the same in our day. We are encouraged to think that, hey, God can do this thing again. Church history tells us a couple of things that are very important. One, and a point number five, and a point number five, one, that God has always preserved the people for himself. That's the lesson of church history, and we should see it. God has always preserved a people for himself. There's always been a seed of God. God has never been without a witness on earth. Elijah says, I am alone. God tells him, don't dare say that, Elijah. I have 7,000 more people who have never bowed to Baal. And in Romans chapter 11 and verse 5, one of my favorite texts in scripture, Romans chapter 11 verse 5 says, even at the present time, even at the present time, there is an election, a remnant, an election according to grace. Even at the present time, there is a remnant, an election according to grace. Church history and Protestant history tells us God has always preserved a people for himself, even in the darkest of period. But secondly then, that God will act again. God will move again. God will do it again if his people seek him to do that which they seek him to do. So why must we just study church history? Ladies and gentlemen, because we draw encouragement from that. Now we're going to end that today, and then tomorrow then in lecture three. Tomorrow then, in lecture three, I'm going to deal with the subject, binary struggle, the faith of the saints. And I'm going to trace throughout the history of the Bible that there has been this constant battle between the seed of the evil one and the seed of God. And I'm calling that lecture, the binary struggle, the faith of the saints. There's always been a war. There's always been a fight for the faith of the saints. And I'm going to make a clarion call to all of us that we must then join the army of God in defending Protestant faith before we even look at it in detail in the next week to come. So I thank you for joining me. Do drop me a word. Let me know that you were there. I thank you for hanging out with me. May the Lord bless you. And then until tomorrow, it's bye-bye from me here. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Till tomorrow then.